Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our study in the book of Genesis. We're now in Genesis chapter 9. We're beginning Genesis chapter 9. I've told you that this toliadote that covers the, the, the worldwide flood, God's worldwide flood judgment, started in chapter 6, verse 9, going to the end of chapter 9. So we're beginning that last chapter, that last major chapter of this story. And, and as we get to chapter 9, we enter a new section of it. Remember, I've told you there's various sections as you look at the story from chapter 6 to chapter 9. And we're beginning one today in this section. It covers the first 17 verses of chapter 9. We really have two more sections remaining. Chapter 9, verse 1 to 17, and chapter 9, verse 18 to the end of the chapter, verse 29. And in this section, we saw previously the results of it in terms of the results of God's worldwide judgment. Noah and his family depart from the ark. They leave the ark and, and the animals do as well. They release the animals. We saw that in chapter 8, verse 17. And then we saw that Noah, uh, he, he had two acts of obedience. He followed God's word. He, God told him to leave the ark, release the animals, so he does that. But we also see that Noah worships the Lord, right? Verse 20 of chapter 8, he builds an altar to the Lord, and he places a sacrifice, many sacrifices, to be honest, because there were animals designated for that particular purpose, animals and birds designated for that particular purpose, and we talked through all of that. God had established the sacrificial system, and Noah responded in obedience to God and in worship to Him. And as we get to chapter 9, and we begin to look at it, Now we see the changes that God brings, brings about because of His judgment. This is a new day. This is a new world. <laughs> Even though it's the same physical planet, changes are coming. And some changes are a little bit more subtle than others. Some are more drastic than others. But as you go through these 17 verses, this is what you see. You see a host of changes. And you see God make a very, very special promise. We call it a covenant in this passage. So a lot of things are going to happen. Let me read the verses to you. I want to read all 17 verses as we get started. It says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. All the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the fish in the sea will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food, just as I've given you grain and vegetables. But you must never eat any meat that still has the lifeblood in it. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Now be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. Then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you that were on the ark, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Then God said, I'm giving you a sign of my covenant. 
that, of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds. And I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the flood waters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, Yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I am confirming with all the creatures on earth. Very interesting passage. Very interesting passage. And we're going to begin today working our way through it. So what God is doing is establishing a new order for humanity. I've told you that when we looked in chapter 8, Noah comes off the boat and he's witnessed the terrifying judgment of God upon the whole world. He actually lived through it. And now he's seen it on the other side in terms of walking out of the ark along with his family. He was cooped up in that ark for about 370 days, a little over a year. They're the, now the only survivors on earth. And when they walk out, they see the devastation. And they, I think like we talked about in chapter 8, he's gripped by the, by the power and judgment of God. And that's what leads him and drives him to obey and to worship. That's chapter 8, that section that started in verse 15 to the end of the chapter, tells us. And Noah didn't just sacrifice one animal. He sacrificed dozens of animals. God had designated those animals. God had designated those animals and those birds for that specific purpose. So Noah did what a genuine believer would do. He commits his life to God, recommit commits his life to God. He, he, he goes to God for, for continual forgiveness from sin. He worships Almighty God. He, he obeys as an act of faith. He understands the lordship of God. He understands the rulership of God. He understands the sovereignty of God, that everything is defined by God himself. And that mankind never, never stands above God and can dictate to him. We've seen that in our study of the book of Genesis. It's actually, you see that through the study of the entire word of God. But especially in, in Noah has been responding and responding. And, and again, we will not hear Noah speak until the end of chapter 9, near the end of chapter 9. Noah has, he's said words, but nothing's been recorded. He's just acting in obedience. And it's a pattern for us. To un we need to see what he sees. We need to realize that God is in charge, that God is sovereign. And so when you get to chapter 9, now it flips in terms of this is what Noah did. This is again now what God does. You see that kind of pattern play out in the book of Genesis, and here it shows up again where now you see the actions of God. And so it's very important to make sure that we understand that, that we're aware of that. God is going to establish a new order for humanity. That's what we're going to see through this study of chapter 9. As we saw at the end of chapter 8, mankind is still sinful, right? They're, they, everything they think or imagine, chapter 8, verse 21, is bent towards evil from even childhood. So sin is remaining. So in this chapter, you would say, well, is God going to eradicate sin? Nope. That's not his plan. He will eradicate sin in the new heavens and the new earth that is spoken of in the scriptures, but not at that present time because Noah is still living in the same heaven and earth. It's just been changed because of the worldwide flood. The geography and the topography have been changed. 
No, he's not going to eradicate sin. So what is he going to do? He's going to provide a framework to manage the spread of sin. That's what he's going to do. That's the change that's coming. See, sin had grown to the place where it had flooded the world. And so God had to flood the world to get rid of it. But he didn't eradicate it. Noah and his family are sinners in need of a Savior, and every child they have will be a sinner in need of a Savior. And you and I are descendants of Noah and his family. Going all the way back to Adam. And we are born into this world with a sinful nature and we need a Savior. So as we walk through this chapter, you're going to see how God provides that framework. It's really God's way of being gracious to all of humanity, beginning with Noah and his family wife and his three sons and their wives, the eight that disembarked and came off of the ark, is is God's way of being gracious to them as well as to all humanity despite humanity's continual pattern of sin. And that's what we see here. It's going to be an interesting chapter. An interesting chapter. And we need to be aware of that. Noah had come to the place where he trusted God explicitly. Where he trusted the Lord explicitly for God to instruct him, guide him as this new beginning is about to take place. And here in chapter 9, God is going to provide that instruction. For Noah. When when you look at this, um, if you look at my notes that I have on my biblical sheet here, um, I have an outline. There's particulars that we're going to note. Five particulars as we walk through the passage. And each one's a blessing. And so we'll go through it systematically as we walk through this whole thing. But God is going to speak and bless. And the first blessing that's coming that we're going to look at is in chapter 9, verse 1. It also shows up again in verse 7. The wording is very similar, and so it shows up again there. It kind of becomes a bracket to what is contained within verse 2 and then verse, well, verse 2 to 6. But it's the blessing of procreation. The blessing of procreation. It starts in chapter 9 with these words, Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply. You notice he he addresses the men here because it's even though the woman bears the child, it's the men who, who, who are the fathers. And so the lineage is, 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 is listed by, by the men, by the fathers. It, you'll find that pattern throughout all of Scripture by and large. It's interesting when you get to the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, four women are mentioned in that one. And that becomes unique, becomes very special. It doesn't mean that, the, the, that Noah's wife is left out of this blessing. It doesn't mean his, their son's three wives are left out of the blessing. It, it's just that God is speaking directly to them. All eight persons are going to be blessed here. It says, then after the act of worship by Noah in the previous chapter and after God had made these statements to himself, 
at the middle, starting at the middle of verse 21 of chapter 8, going all the way down to verse 22. Then after that, God blessed Noah. And this blessing, you've seen this before, but you're going to see it again. Uh, Genesis 17, chapter 22, chapter 24, chapter 26, chapter 28, chapter 35, chapter 48 and 49. You're going to see this idea of, of giving a blessing. Even there was a commentator who, who, who took this as the major running theme through the book of Genesis. It means God's favor. It means I am, I am about to speak and I am going to make known to you how things are going to work. I'm going to provide for you uh, the pattern moving forward. I am going to provide the instructions for you. God is telling Noah and God is God's not on Noah's level and Noah knows that. God is God. He is sovereign. He is Lord in the universe. He establishes truth. Not only does he speak truth, he establishes it. He is the, 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 the arbiter of everything. He is, he is he's the one who knows the beginning to the end. He, he, he's all-powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent. And so we, we just call that sovereignty, perfection, all of his attributes. David would talk about that in Psalm 139. And so it's God who is perfect in all of his being, who's the master controller, who knows it all, who is over all. And we are all accountable to him. He speaks to Noah and he says, this is my agenda. This is it. This is what I want you to understand moving forward. You need to know these particulars. You need to know what I want you to know. And it's very important that you get this. And it's very important that you grasp this. And it's very important that you don't forget this. Notice the first particular. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Doesn't that sound very familiar? It should. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 22 and verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 22. God had said that same kind of language for the fish and the birds. But in verse 28... God blessed male and female, Adam and Eve, and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, govern it. You know what God is going to do here? And it really comes out in these first few verses, really, verse 1 to 4. And if you want to, you can include verse 7. Um, it, it really uh, becomes very prominent. God goes back to what he had stated back to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, after it says he created them. And he goes back to that same idea. He said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth gov and govern it. Notice, he says, fill the earth, but he doesn't say govern it. There's something different coming. There's something a little bit different, a little unique. Even though in, at the end of verse 2, he'll say, I have placed them in your power, there's still something different in regards to the animals. And when we get to verse 2, we'll look at that. But he's going back to that original statement. It's like we got a new beginning, Noah. It said, this is, this is a new day. Even though this is not like Adam and Eve. Because when they were created, sin was not present among them. Now it is. 
And the first area to focus on here, the first particular, and I just want to look at this today in our session, is, is what's, what he says here, be fruitful and multiply. Why is that important? Fill the earth. Why does he say that? It, it goes back to the nature of how God had made humanity in his own image. Mankind is, you could say, transcendent in that they're unlike all of the other animals. They're unlike all the plants. We are not like that. We were made in the image of God. We bear a spiritual life. Besides a physical life, we bear a spiritual life that is not visible physically, but that does exist. Man is made, mankind is made in the image of God. We have attributes given to us by God that are not given to any of the animals and any of the plants, any of the vegetation, any of the, the, the animals that scurry along the ground, all the birds, all the fish. They don't possess what we possess. God has made us unique in regards to the creation we have been given attributes of personhood. Animals don't possess that. Self-consciousness, reason, abstract thinking, appreciation of beauty, emotion, moral consciousness, and above all, the capacity to make relationships, to personally relate to other people, as well as to personally and especially relate to Almighty God. To be able to love Him, to be able to know Him, to be able to worship Him, to be able to sing praises to His name. And even though animals can procreate, they can only procreate physical life. Mankind procreates physical life and that same kind of spiritual life. So we're unique. It's a wonderful blessing to be able to procreate spiritual life. And God is the, you know, David, would, David fully understands who made him in the womb. God did that. See, mankind, humanity, not only a physical being, but we're a spiritual being, a rational being. We have moral consciousness. We're a being, we're a creation by God of whom we can have relationships. And God created the most sweetest relationship of all, on a human level, and that is the relationship between a man and his wife. Because that's how procreation takes place. It's the only way procreation takes place. That's why any form of homosexuality, any form that goes against a man and a woman... As the definition of marriage, because God de defined that in Genesis chapter 2, anything that would go against that is an abomination in the eyes of God. It is. I don't care how people take that. I don't care what you think about it. It's just true. Anything that goes against the, the union between a man and a woman that would say there's another way uh -uh. That is an expression of sinful ideology to the hilt. It's such a depravity. The Bible speaks to this. And as we go through the scriptures, you will see this. You can see it clearly in Paul's writings in Romans 1. It's, mankind lost in its sin twists 
the, the creation of God and makes it into something that is an abomination, that is unnatural, that is not normal. God is telling Noah's family, his sons, and each one had a wife, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And when we get to chapter 10, you're going to see that they do that. The names are listed. The genealogical records are presented. Here's the thing. You may would say, well, you know, God could have said to Noah, you know, I really, really, after what's been going on, after all the sin in this world and how sin had grown and, and the world was filled with violence, it's been going on since Adam and Eve and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. You know what, Noah, I think it's best. I'm not going to allow you to have any more babies, no more children. We just don't want to populate anymore. We don't want any more children. There was even a movie about Noah some years ago and that was the premise of it. The character who plays Noah believes that God is done with humanity and that he says in the movie, well, we will die and that'll be it. No. The movie has it wrong. God is saying, procreate. My plan is for there to be more children and for the world to go on, right? Planting and harvesting is going to continue. Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. He is planning, God is planning for people to be born into this world because the one he has promised when he spoke to, the, to, to Satan and said, the, the one that I am going to send who's going to destroy you which we know is the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who would come at the, at the right time, recorded in the Gospels. That He's going to come. So there has to be procreation. God could have said, you know, I don't want to do this deal anymore. Just I'm going to let you live until you're dead. He'll just start over. I'll sterilize all of you. You won't produce any more children. It's all done. You know, that's after you die, it's all over. It can begin again. No, that's not God's plan. He didn't do that. He gave to sinners the blessing of marriage, the blessing of children, and the blessing of family. And he knew that that would produce billions of sinners living sinful lives like yours and mine. He knew that what that meant, but he wasn't going to change that. He was going to keep that going. He still wanted them to procreate. From what we can see in the text, from what we can see, in the biblical text, Noah never had any more children, but his sons did. They had many of them. The genealogical record that we'll see in chapter 10 deals with the three sons and those that came from them. The same statement is made if you go to verse 7, now be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. So fill the earth matches the idea of repopulation. So when you break this down, God is blessing Noah and he says, so be fruitful. That speaks to the womb. Multiply means multiple children coming from the womb at different times. <laughs> you know, they're Maybe twins, but different times. And then when we get to chapter 10, we'll talk more about all of that. But when, when, you, when you see God's wording here, the way he states it is 
fruitful means uh, the conception of, of children. Multiply means the birth of the children. Filling the earth means the population of the children. And so people will give birth just as it was before Noah's day. But what will change, as you will see in chapter 10, is that people won't live as long as they did before the flood. So God is going to establish a new order for humanity. Some of it's the same, but then it gets affected by other things that are changed. So you got to see the picture as a whole. The five particulars that are mentioned, first one being the blessing of procreation, is that you would expect God to end the deal, but he doesn't. So he keeps that going. But it's how other things are factored into this, and especially the covenant that God's going to make when he says in verse 8, and we'll, when we get there, we'll talk more about it. He says, I will confirm my covenant with you and with your descendants. So if the covenant's going to be made and there has to be descendants, they have to be given the blessing. So all of, of, of multiplying and filling the earth, right? being fruitful. So you have to, we're going to look at these particulars and individual, we're going to walk through the passage, but then you got to add it all together. This is God's agenda that's being communicated to Noah about how it's all going to go forward. And we're just getting started. We're just getting started. It's very important that we walk through this in a orderly fashion and be able to understand what is going to be the changes as a result of the God, of, of God giving his judgment upon the world. Because what God says here even impacts how we live today. And it will impact how God will explain things in more detail in other parts of the scriptures as time goes on. But God says to Noah, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, repopulate it. Because guess what? I have a plan. I have a plan to bring redemption. I have a plan to bring salvation. And that plan is that one day, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one that's promised, is going to be born into this world. And he's the one that this story is all about. So have children. Yes, they're going to be sinners. But have children. It's very, very important that you do so. Let's pray. Dear God, we do thank you again for this time to look at your word, to look at the book of Genesis. Lord, as we now are entering into chapter 9 and all that we're going to be learning, there's a lot of details here that fit together. And so we have to see the broader picture of it. But Lord, just help us as we walk through all these details, all these particular things that you have stated, that you stated to Noah. Help us to understand them. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're just kind of getting our feet wet, if you want to call it that, kind of getting into chapter 9. We'll develop more of it. Next time, we're going to look at verse 2, 3, and 4 and, and look at another particular. Uh, this is in regards to the animals. It's very important that we look at this. And so we're just going to keep walking through the chapter uh, session by ses session. And so anyway, tell others about the series. Tell others about the YouTube channel, the book study of Genesis. and um, And... Uh, may God's blessing be upon you, and we'll see you next time.